good evening, everybody. Uh, very nice to see so many of you on uh, Zoom meeting this evening. Um, it uh, promises to be another uh, uh, cracking evening um, with Nick talking about Madagascar. Um, usual rules of engagement, um, uh, please would be very, very grateful if you'd uh, ensure that your uh, microphones remain muted and your video off. Um, Nick has finally revealed himself. He's peeled back the blue tack <laughs> from his camera. <laughs> um, uh, and it's very nice to see him. Um, Nick, we went to Madagascar together, if I'm not mistaken, for Festival of Wildlife. And I think it was probably in 2008. I was trying to work it out earlier. It was either, I've got a note of it somewhere, but <clears throat> not immediately in front of me. I think it was either 2007 or 2008, but I think it was it 2008. Was, uh, year after Serengeti. Yeah, so that was uh, there or thereabouts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Some, some, somewhere like that. Um, so that's the only time I've been to Madagascar, and I have to say I loved every minute of it. I thought it was absolutely wonderful. Um, and, uh, and of course, um, you lead a number of trips to Madagascar, um, and... Uh, as everybody knows, I'm sure we also tailor make lots of lovely holidays to Madagascar. Um, Nick is probably uh, the world's leading expert on Madagascar, um, uh, having been there many, many times, having written um, a number of books, uh, including, I think I'm right in saying, Nick, the very first guide to the mammals of Madagascar. That's right, yeah, 1999. 1999, good gracious. Um, since when, I know you've told me, and I suspect that was, this will come up in the talk, so uh, don't, you don't need to reveal it at this point, but since when, I suspect there have been a number of other um, lemur species that have been discovered, um, and I suspect also that that is uh, uh, part of the new um, book that you're writing, but well, I suspect we'll hear more about that. Yes, um, indeed. So um, I am going to... Uh, propose that we that we press on but just a quick reminder to everybody that Nick will be absolutely delighted to answer questions at the end of this presentation I've already got a number of questions questions that have been sent through to me on email actually some absolutely super questions um, but please do feel free to send questions through on chat um, for those of you on mobile devices you'll find the, the chat facility at the top of your screens I believe um, if you're on a computer or a laptop um, you should find um, the chat facility at the bottom of your screen. And if you um, click on chat, they will come directly to me um, and I'll be able to pose those questions to Nick um, at the end of his presentation. Have I forgotten anything, Nick? Do I need to tell anyone, anyone anything else? I don't that think so. sounds good to me, Chris. Okay, oh boy, I shall leave you to it and uh, very Thank much you. looking forward to hearing your presentation. I'll chat to you later. Okie doke. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm going to take you on a whistle stop tour around my favourite island. I've been captivated Madag by Madagascar for a very long time, long before I ever went for the first time. I was reading up about it as a kid. I still remember seeing David Attenborough Zoo Quest, which were made before I was born, um, but seeing them and just thinking what a peculiar, marvellous place it um, was likely to be. So when I got the chance to go for the very first time, in 1991, this is me, and back in 1991, age 27. Um, and I was working in Mauritius at the time and saved up enough money to buy a ticket, a return ticket from Mauritius. I stuck 200 quid at the equivalent of in my back pocket, spent 100 pounds on film. Yes, remember that. And went to Madagascar for a month. And things were pretty basic then. This is me in Ranamafan National Park, which had just opened and one, was one of only three national parks in the, on the island at that time. Um, I camped here for four days. It was pretty basic, um, as you can see. I'm glad to say that facilities have improved somewhat in Madagascar now, um, at least in many places. Um, but this was camping in Ranamafana back in 1991. Um, but I was just captivated by the place, the people, um, the landscapes and of course the wildlife and back then there was so little information to go on to find out basic stuff about 
the animals you were looking at. And what captivated me was just how bizarre and different everything was. The forest that I went into, whether they be dry forests or rainforest, was so different to places I'd been previously. Um, and of course, the wildlife was spectacular. There were so many things that were utterly peculiar to Madagascar. They were endemic. They were found nowhere else. One of the highlights for any trip to Madagascar is, of course, seeing chameleons. And more than half of the world's species are found in Madagascar and nowhere else. Amphibians too, particularly in rainforests, were just sensational. And every time I went out on night walks, I'd find different frogs and so forth. And I just, I just felt that every corner that I would find something new and different. Um, every bird I looked at seemed completely different to things that I'd seen elsewhere. This is another endemic bird. It's called a sunbird asiku. Um, and there's only four different varieties in the family, and they're all restricted to Madagascar. But of course, the thing that I primarily went for back in 1991 was to see the lemurs, um, of which there are many, there were many then. There are even greater number now, as Chris alluded to, as new species have been described or existing taxa have been split. Um, so when I first went, there were probably about 45 species. There are now 107. Um, this is one of the most beautiful, a diadem sifaka, which I'll come back to later. And of course, really peculiar species like the eye eye, which I first remember learning about um, back in the early 70s when uh, Shell garages produced a series of cards uh, in conjunction with um, WWF. And the eye eye was card number one, and it was my most prized possession when I. Um, finally managed to collect that particular one and the little snippet of information on the back said that there were probably fewer than 50 IIs remaining. Now thankfully that didn't turn out to be the case and I'll come back to that later but at the time IIs were thought to be one of the rarest animals on earth. The root of everything in, being, in Madagascar being so unusual is buried in deep history of course you have to go back to the time of Gondwana land several million, uh, 100 million years ago. Um, this graphic is suggesting 500 million years ago, when all of the southern continents were all collected together under one mass, as we know, called Gondwana land. And as you can see, what became Madagascar is nestled um, right in the middle of that. And then over the millennia, as Gondwana land fragmented Madagascar, gradually split from other land and masses to become an island. So roughly speaking, it broke away from the African mainland somewhere in the region of 180 million years ago. Um, at that time, it was still attached to India. Um, and then it separated from what is modern day India somewhere in the region of 100 to maybe 80 million years ago. And India drifted north to eventually collide with what's now the Asian. Um, continent. So Madagascar has been an island in its current guise for the best part of 80 million years, which makes it the oldest island in the world. As a consequence, obviously, the evolutionary forces that have occurred on Madagascar have molded things in a way that's so different to anywhere else. One of the other consequences of it being so old as an island is that so many of the species that have their origins uh, elsewhere had to arrive on Madagascar by rafting because they came along long after, after uh, Madagascar became an island. So all of the mammals, with the exception of bats, of course, that fly, had to really arrive on Madagascar or their ancestors had to arrive on Madagascar by rafting. And that's true of plant species as well, um, amphibians, reptiles. Obviously, there were some resident species that were their dinosaur species, some of the oldest dinosaur fossils ever found from Madagascar. And they would have been on Madagascar as the continent fragmented. But everything that we see today has its origins in ancestors that arrived by rafting. The peculiarities of Madagascar's climate means that in a very broad sense, you can divide it into three main um, habitat areas. Down the eastern side, the right-hand side of this map, 
is rainforest and you can see there's an area of highland mountainous region in the center which means all of the rain that's coming from the Indian Ocean side, the eastern side, primarily gets dumped on that eastern side of the island, which is very wet. Therefore, the western side of the island is largely in rain shadow, so it's very dry. So the central and northern western regions um, have a dry forest. The eastern side of the country has rainforest. And the very southern part, southwest and southern part, has a very peculiar arid forest called spiny forest. So I'm just going to take you on a whistle-stop tour around these different habitats because each of them is home to very, very different species. So this really bizarre looking habitat is spiny forest. These trees, they look very superficially like cacti, but they're actually woody trees. They are called octopus trees and they belong to an endemic family called the Didioraceae. Um, and these are really characteristic of spiny forest areas. Lace covered with incredibly sharp spines, hence the name. Um, and many of the species that live here have obviously adapted ways and means around such a harsh environment. Lots of um, water retentive species as well, like this bulbous giant pachypodium that is the best part of six or seven meters tall. And baobabs, of course, are a real feature of the dry areas of southern and western Madagascar. I suspect most of you are familiar with baobabs from Africa, where there's a single species, that in Sonia digitata. There's also one species in uh, Australia, and there are eight in total in the world, and the other six are only found in Madagascar. This is Adinsonia Zar, which is only found down in the very southern and west, southwestern parts of the island. This is a different species, Adinsonia rubus stiper, and this particular slide is of note because this tree, which this individual tree, which is in a park down in the very far southwest, uh, an area called Simanampusuts. Um, this particular tree is reckoned to be in the region of three and a half thousand years old. So just picture in your mind's eye when this was a seedling, what was happening on the British Isles, where we were still attached to Europe, I suspect, or were we? Maybe not. Um, but you can imagine how backward our civilization was when this tree was a sapling. And of course, dry areas have their own peculiar mix of species. I'll keep coming back to chameleons on a regular basis, but there are species down in the dry southwest, like this spiny back to water chameleon, that are only found there. Very particular regional endemism is a real feature of Madagascar. You have to go to very specific areas to see specific species because they have small ranges, largely because of the peculiarities of climate, but more recently because of deforestation issues, which again, I'll we'll come back to later. Some more reptiles that are unusual. This is a boa, it's called Dumeril's boa. There are only three types of boa on Madagascar. And interestingly, all the other boas are found in Central and South America, which kind of alludes to some of the evolution we passed when um, through Gondwana land, Madagascar probably had some sort of land bridge or link to South America because boas are not found in Africa um, or true boas like this are not found in Africa. So Dumeril's boa is only found right down in the far south and southwest of the island. There are some very unusual birds too in this part of the island. Uh, this is the long-tailed ground roller, which is only found in a very, very small area of spiny forest in the extreme southwest. Again, another endemic family. There are only five ground rollers. The other four, which I'll show you later, are restricted to rainforest regions. And a kua, which superficially looks like a bit like a roadrunner. Um, this is a terrestrial kua. Some of them are arboreal. This is a giant kua, roughly the size of a pheasant. But again, a distant relative of the cuckoo family, but a group of birds, again, restricted to Madagascar. And of course, lemurs, um, perhaps the most famous and um, recognizable lemur of all, ring-tailed lemurs, um, are primarily found in south and southwestern regions, in the drier regions. 
and some inland areas, which I'll again come back to. What makes ringtails interesting um, is that they're atypical. Um, most, if not all, other lemurs are primarily arboreal, whereas ringtails, during the day at least, spend probably a third of their time actually on the ground, which makes them most unusual. There are no other lemurs that spend so long um, foraging and moving around at ground level. And early morning in the deep south of Madagascar can get very chilly. So one of the other characteristic behaviors that you often see is lemurs basking first thing in the morning to catch the first rays of sunlight and warm themselves up. Um, these shots that I'm showing are taken at a very famous reserve called Barenti, which tends to feature on many itineraries because it's such a delightful place to wander around. It's not necessarily the most natural of places because it's a private reserve and it's very small, but it's nonetheless delightful to wander around because there are groups of ringtails that are very easy to see and some of the other lemurs that are peculiar to the southern regions. If you'd like to see babies, then End of August, September, early October is the best time right across Madagascar for all lemur species, but especially for ringtails, and obviously um, makes for wonderful photography opportunities. Um, some of the other lemurs that are well known from the southern regions, very elegant Vero Sifaka, um, which is not only found in spiny forest areas, but adjacent gallery forest areas in which this shot was taken. Um, and incredibly acrobatic and um, able to feed in this called suspensory feeding. They're able to grasp with their hind feet equally well to their hands and will often hang in this suspensory posture and feeding to access primarily leaves, but they will eat unripe fruit as well. And of course, very famously, um, they're renowned for this wonderful skip-like dance across open ground. Now, I personally think this is something that they've probably developed and evolved in the relatively recent past to cross open spaces. If you were to wind the clock back two, three thousand years before humans arrived on the island, and we think Madagascar was almost entirely covered in forest, therefore there wouldn't have been open spaces, and therefore there wouldn't have been the necessity for these lemurs to come down onto the ground. So my hunch is that this is a relatively recently learned behavior as a consequence of forest fragmentation. I mentioned this place, this is Lake Simanampasut, where the incredibly old baobab um, is found. Down in the very far southwest of the island, it's the only major soda lake in Madagascar. And is the only place that you're likely to see greater flamingos, which actually do breed. Nothing like the quantities or numbers that you see in soda lakes in East Africa, but nonetheless interesting for that. Although the primary reason that I would go to somewhere like Simenam Pasotra is to look around in the forest at night. There are ringtails here, and they're quite difficult to find. They're quite shy. But um, my visits to this particular park have been primarily uh, aimed at looking for some of the nocturnal species, nocturnal mammals, um, in particular, like this lesser hedgehog tenrec. Um, tenrecs are another group that are primarily found in Madagascar. And there are numerous species. I have been doing a lot of research, as I'll come back to over the last year, to update books and things. And there are now over 40 species of tenrec known. But the ones you're likely to see, uh, the larger ones, um, this is smaller than our hedgehog, but obviously very similar, at least outwardly, but rather peculiar to see that it's quite an agile climate. So it's not only found on the ground, but equally likely to be found foraging for insects up at, if not in the canopy, but certainly in the forest understory. The main reason I've been to Simon Ampasotsu is to look for this glorious little animal. This is called Grandidies vontsira. Um, it's one of the island's eight endemic carnivores. It used to be referred to as a mongoose, um, which is incorrect and inaccurate because they're only incredibly distant related to mongooses. All eight species of carnivore on Madagascar evolved from a single colonizing ancestor, which arrived probably 25 million years ago. Um, and they've now 
speciated and diversified from that single ancestor. Um, so they're not in any close sense related to mongooses. Way back, their closest link is probably to um, African mongooses, but they share a common ancestor probably going back 40 plus million years. So not in any sense a um, close relationship. And Simenampusuts and the areas around Simenampusuts are the only place this particular species is found. A little further inland, but still down in the southern region, another spectacular, visually spectacular area. This is a park called Isali, which was one of the original three parks that existed when I first visited. I think it's actually Madagascar's oldest park dating back to the 1920s. Um, not necessarily the best wildlife park, but certainly, as you can see from this shot, um, spectacular scenically and very interesting from a botanical point of view. Lots of unusual succulents and arid adapted species like this pachypodium. This is a local endemic pachypodium. Um, but there are lemurs here in some of the forest areas, um, ringtails being one, verosifarcas being another. And in keeping with their um, penchant for moving around on the ground. The ringtails come out of the forest and clamber around on the sandstone and the rocks and so forth. So this is a particularly rewarding area if you're lucky enough to find groups of ringtails to see them outside forest. So if you concentrate now on the left-hand western side of the island, at one time, that would have been completely swathed in deciduous forest. Um, it's largely dry for nine months of the year and then gets significant rainfall between December and February, and then is dry primarily for the remaining time. So it's an incredibly seasonally distinct part of the island. And obviously, as a consequence, most of the species that live there have had to evolve and adapt to periods of extreme wet and then periods of extreme aridity. And the forests are very, very different. This is one of the areas that's really dominated by baobabs. This is up on the northwest coast and is one of the few places where you perhaps get some sort of inkling of what it might have been like to arrive on Madagascar, at least on the western side of Madagascar, say 2000 years ago before major human impacts when lots of forests still came all the way down to the coast and this is the sort of thing you could have potentially seen and it would have been a site like unlike any other forest you would have visited anywhere on earth so as i've alluded to this particular area western madagascar is the real stronghold for many of the baobab species and this is the largest of them and in so near grandidiera which is restricted to the central western part of the island. Um, spectacular statuesque trees, you can see this one is in fruit. Um, neither of these two shots really give you an inkling as to just the scale and size of these trees, but perhaps this shot will. So interestingly, this was taken on my very first visit to this region, which we think was in 94. So best part of 25 plus years old. Um, long before anybody really went here. Um, I camped here overnight so I could take pictures of sunrise and sunset and literally just had a tin of sardines and some water as I camped by the side of the road. Um, today, the same place looks like this and it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site and there's a very nice cafe and a gift shop. So things have changed rather a lot in um, that intervening time. You can actually see that one or two of the Bengabams have sadly fallen down as well, but it's still a spectacular place. And a road still runs through the center of this Baobab um, area, which is called Baobab Alley, Alley de Baobab. Um, so it's a real tourist draw, and you'll be very lucky to go there now and have it to yourself um, because it's on so many itineraries now. But uh, 25 years ago, I camped there and didn't see another soul. Um, so one or two of the interesting species that we're likely to encounter in Western forests. This is a day gecko or felsuma, which you could encounter in rainforests as well. This is the largest species, it's called felsuma madagascariensis, giant day gecko. 
which can reach probably 20 centimeters in length, a spectacular emerald green, as you can see. And this is restricted to the western drier side of the island. Another boa, um, snakes feature heavily in most talks that I've tried to do simply because I love snakes. Um, this is, I think, one of the world's most spectacularly camouflaged species. It's the Madagascar ground boa, um, which is, not surprisingly, not an easy um, snake to find because it's so beautifully camouflaged. Most of the time I find them tends to be at night when they're active and hunting. And then to get a shot like this, I've staged it. Um, so I would um, arrange the snake in a suitable place on leaf litter, etc. So I'd be able to photograph it and illustrate its um, capacity to camouflage itself. One or two birds from the western side as well. This is uh, the Madagascar fish eagle, which uh, in voice sounds almost identical to an African fish eagle, but is actually one of the world's rarest birds of prey. There are probably fewer than 70 pairs left. And there are one or two places on the western side of the island, um, a place called Ankarafansk for once, and Anjajavi uh, for a second um, location. Um, where your chances of seeing this particular rare bird are very good, but um, when you realize there are only 70 pairs plus floating birds um, around, there's probably fewer than 200 birds in total remaining, so it is one of the world's very rarest species. And equally rare, or not maybe not equally, but certainly equally bizarre and unusual and incredibly rare, a giant jumping rat. Um, which is only found in a really tiny area of forest in the central west. Um, this is kind of, well, it's the size of a rabbit and hops around like a miniature kangaroo. It's nocturnal, lives in burrows, um, lives in family groups. Um, and if you go to an area called Karindi in the central west, um, that's your best shot at seeing a giant jumping rat. But you have to stay up late and you have to stay out at night and stay up late because they don't like full moon. So going when there's a bright moon is not a good idea. And if there is a bright moon, you have to wait for the moon to, uh, uh, the full moon to sort of dissipate later in the night and then they'll come out. If you go when there isn't a full moon, then your chances of seeing them early in the night are better, but they're not easy to track down. Plenty of lemurs in western forest too. This is a brown lemur, um, which is quite widely distributed. Some brown lemurs also occur in rainforests in the east, but wonderfully acrobatic and um, always a joy to find groups of them high in the canopy, moving around because they tend to be very, very active, particularly during daylight hours. And some different sifakas in the west as well. Further in the northwestern forest, this beautiful creature called cockerel sifaka. And Karafansk and Anjajavi are two really good places to see this beautiful creature. One of the real features of Western Forest is doing night walks. And night walks in general are one of the features of Madagascar. I think it's the best place on earth to do night walks because you just tend to see so many different things, so much variety, and there are so many different nocturnal species, lemurs being one of which there are countless. Um, this is a particularly interesting group. This is a dwarf lemur, belongs to a genus called Chirogalius, um, of which there are umpteen different species now. The one of the common things that um, the, the genus exhibits is that they're the only group of primates that are obligate hibernators. They have to hibernate during the dry season. So you wouldn't see them during the dry season. So between May and the end of September, you would not see a dwarf lemur because they're all tucked away in holes in trees or nests and hibernating. Um, when they emerge from hibernation, end of September into October, November time, when this shot was taken, their tails are very skinny, as you can see here. But then over the course of the wet season, where they feed up and fatten up, a huge proportion, sometimes 25% of their body weight is laid down in fat in the tail. So that tail would swell. And were I to have taken this photograph towards the end of March, early April, its tail would be enormous um, because it was holding so much fat reserves on which they rely, of course, during the hibernation period. 
This is another peculiar nocturnal species. It's called a fork marksling, which is a gum and sap feeder. Not only found in western forests, but easier to see in western forests than uh, elsewhere. Carindi again is a good place to see them. Um, always very high up in the canopy, so you tend to hear them. They have a really distinctive, piercing, loud call, which um, is a real characteristic of dust uh, in the areas they occur. But because they tend to stay, stay high in the canopy, they're not always the easiest animals to see. Um, this is an interesting species as well. You will encounter mouse lemurs, the smallest primates in the world, in most forests you visit in Madagascar, but in one particular forest in the central western part of Madagascar, Karindi um, again, and neighboring areas, you have a chance of seeing this particular species, which has the accolade of being the smallest primate in the world. It's called Madame Berth's mouse lemur, and it weighs somewhere between 25 and 30 grams. And to give you an idea of what that looks like, the one on the left is a Madame Berth's mouse lemur, and the mouse lemur on the right is a grey mouse lemur, which normally weighs somewhere between 50 and 70 grams. So um, just an indication of the diversity. And there are now over 20 species of mouse lemur. Um, when I first went to Madagascar back in 91, there were only two. Interesting carnivores as well. This, uh, going back to one of the eight endemic carnivores, this is called the Bocky Bocky or narrow striped Bocky. Um, again, only found in western, dry western forests and southwestern forests and the forests of the central west, Karindi and neighboring areas are one of the best places to see it. This is Karindi in the dry season. This shot was taken in early November. As you can see, incredibly dry. This is a riverbed. So where I have to visit Karindi in um, February time, this time of year, this river would be flowing, but it dries up largely by June time. And obviously by October, November, there's only scraps of rather stagnant rank water remaining. But because water is so scarce, water holes like this become incredibly important resources for all manner of species, birds, lemurs, carnivores, you name it, this is one of the few areas where water is readily available. So staking out a water hole like this can be very, very rewarding. And you would see groups of lemurs coming down, um, things like brown lemurs. Siparkas wouldn't because they don't need to drink. They get all the moisture they require from their leaves, the leaves they eat. But if you get very lucky, staking out a place like this might give you the opportunity of seeing the fusa, which is Madagascar's largest carnivore. A large male fusa would weigh about 10 kilos and is a real lemur hunting specialist, although they'll eat pretty much anything. And they're incredibly adept both on the ground and climbers as well. Um, as you can see from the body plan, this is a male fusa. They have a lovely long tail as a counterbalance. They have retractile, semi-retractile claws, rather like a cat. In fact, when they were first described back in the, I think about 1750, they were thought to be a cat and were placed in the felid family. And it's only later, with later research, that they were originally, or subsequently, I should say, placed with the civets. And um, then more latterly, it was realized that all of the Madagascar carnivores are derived from single common ancestors. So they belong to a group that is simply known as the Malagasy carnivores now. Day. And one of their peculiar traits is they have reversible ankles, a bit like a squirrel, so they can climb up and down narrow tree trunks like this with incredible agility and speed, obviously something they require when hunting arboreal lemurs. And this is a female, as you can see, a much smaller, more gracile creature. She weighs two thirds of a big male, so six, seven kilos. So they're not huge animals, but they're substantial and pack a punch and incredibly muscular. Um, fossils have incredible mating systems. Um, females only come into Easter for about one week per year at the end of October, early November. And they generally retreat to a favored tree when they're in Easter and advertise the fact that they're in Easter by calling and producing scent. 
which then means that males come from miles around following the calls and the scent. And over the course of a week, while the female is in um, her mating tree, she can mate with anywhere between four, six, even seven different males. Um, and it's a very noisy affair, and they've evolved incredible um, sperm competition techniques as a consequence, because obviously mating with so many males, the males don't know if they're going to be the successful father. So male fossa have actually evolved enormous penises and produce huge quantities of semen in order to try and ensure that they're the successful fertilizing um, partner. Um, but they don't know because they play no part in um, rearing the youngsters. So fossil mating like this is incredibly noisy and um, quite violent at times. And the female, when she's had enough, will very quickly turn around and make sure the male um, uh, is sent packing um, when she deems appropriate. Within the Western forest, there are some really interesting little enclaves of forests that grow around limestone escarpments. These were once actually coral reefs that have been obviously subsequently eroded and weathered into these amazing rock formations. Um, Pinnacle cast, it's called in Madagascar, it's called Singi. There are three main areas, a place called Bemaraha in the central west, Namaroka, also a remote part of the western side of the island. And this shot was taken uh, right up in the far north on the western side in a place called Ankaran. Um, spectacular places. And even amongst these rocks, there are lemurs living in the forest and crossing over the sharp rocks to get from one patch of forest to another. This is a male crown lemur. And not surprisingly, being limestone areas with underground water systems, there are huge cavern um, networks beneath the limestone um, areas. And Namkarana in particular is probably the single most diverse place on Madagascar for bats, um, which are obviously as a mammal group, one that you tend to see less frequently than other mammals. You're aware they may be flying around, but they're not easy to see, but they're over 30 species have been recorded in Ankarana alone. One that you have got a good chance of seeing, not only in Ankarana, but other places, both west and east, is Commerson's leaf nose bat, one of the larger insectivorous species. Um, and flying foxes, there's an endemic flying fox in Madagascar. And in some of the caves in Madagascar, you might get lucky and see straw colored bats, which have large colonies. Having said that, I would actually encourage anyone visiting Ankarina not to go in search of these bats because too many people going into the caves and shining torches does cause disturbance, which is something that's been relatively recently found out. So this shot was taken ooh, at least 12 years ago. And I now, if I went to Ankarina, I wouldn't go into the caves looking for the bats simply because of the disturbance you're likely to cause. Also up in the north, and again with a western climate, is one of my absolute favourite parts of Madagascar, famous favourite areas. So it's a place called Darena, which is not a national park, um, but it's just the most peculiar and wonderful combination of factors that make it so endearing. Um, as you can see, this, this is the, a village called Andrano Simati which is just on the edge of the forest near Darling. Incredibly dry, brutally hot in the um, uh, summer season. You know, temperatures way over 40 degrees on a daily basis. Um, so the local people um, have a real tough time of it. And one of the things that is peculiar to this area is that many areas um, have very, very minimal, but at least if you're Malagasy worthwhile, gold deposits. So it's quite big business in this part of the island to dig for gold. And if you go into some of the forest areas, the forest floor is pockmarked with 
these mines as local people pan and sift for gold. And they are often dig down several meters. And as you can imagine, it's pretty dangerous because tunnels collapse and so forth. And over the course of a month, they might get the equivalent of three or four rice grains of gold. But in a Malagasy sense, that's enough to be a worthwhile livelihood. But an incredibly tough way to make a living and survive, of course. And these gold uh, minings have obviously caused a lot of destruction and disturbance on, on the forest understory. But remarkably, there are some incredibly rare lemur species that live in these forests and survive, partly because of local beliefs, which are faddies or taboos, which prevent um, um, the lemurs ever being hunted. So it's a taboo or faddy to hunt these lemurs. They're protected by these local beliefs and regarded as sacred. So the lemurs will actually come into the edges of villages and be fed. And these are wild animals, but over the course of however many hundreds of years or whatever, they've become used to the people and will come into the edge of villages to be fed and then somehow manage to cling to existence in the canopy of the trees while the forest understory is being destroyed. So it's this wonderful, rather bizarre and disturbing juxtaposition of incredibly rare people, um, incredibly rare people, incredibly um, uh, uh, poor people scratching around to find a living while an incredibly rare species is able to survive in the forest adjacent. So Darwin, I find, is the most one of the most endearing places to visit in Madagascar, not only for seeing lemurs like golden crown sifaka at close quarters because they're so tolerant, uh, but obviously also the photographic opportunities that, that it affords, and just that feeling of um, juxtaposition with local people and an encapsulation of so many of the environmental difficulties that Madagascar faces. This is a sequence I stitched together in Photoshop to show the um, acrobatics of a golden crown sifaka leaping. Darena is also a place you have a realistic chance of seeing the lemur that's responsible for these excavations in a dead tree. If you were somewhere else in the world, you might think a woodpecker had made these holes. There are no woodpeckers in Madagascar. The animal responsible for this is also responsible for making a nest, one of the very few primates that on a daily basis makes a nest and sleeps in it. It's a nocturnal species that sleeps in a nest and excavates insect grubs from rotting wood like a woodpecker. It is, of course, an eye eye. So as I mentioned back at the start, at one time, not a million years ago, in fact, 40 years ago, um, eye eyes were thought to be on the brink of extinction. Um, Rather ironically, as more research has taken place in Madagascar, it's been become apparent, being discovered that they occur very widely across remaining Malagasy forests, rainforest and western forest, but at incredibly low densities. So they're still very, very difficult animals to see. And Darwin is one of the very few places you have a realistic chance of seeing one in the wild. And on several of the trips I've done to Madagascar over the last three or four years. We've been very lucky uh, in seeing IIs on occasion when we've been to Darwin. It's obviously something we invest quite a lot of time in. We have local guides know how to look for them, know how to find the nest. And if you find a nest and you know an II is sleeping in it, that's the hard work done because it's simply a question of waiting outside the nest at dusk until it emerges. And then you, obviously you're going to see it. Um, but um, nonetheless, it's an incredibly special experience being able to be in a forest with what must be one of the most peculiar mammals on the planet. When they were first discovered and described, they were thought to be a rodent. They have incisors that permanently grow like rodents. They have enormous ears like a bat, which are used to listen for insect grubs moving around within rotting wood. And once they've located an insect grub, they're able to use those chisel-like teeth to gnaw into the wood, and then they deploy that remarkable middle finger that you can probably just make out uh, on this photograph, which is nothing more than bone covered in skin. And they use that to 
room could have gone out of the hole. So just the most sensationally um, evolved and adapted animal, um, and unlike pretty much anything else you're likely to see anywhere. Um, so the final region to look at is it sways down the eastern side of the island, um, the rainforest area, which all things considered is undoubtedly my favorite part. It's the most diverse part of the island, an incredible number of species that have found nowhere else, plants, trees, and all wildlife species. Beautiful rainforest, obviously um, very much fragmented now, which I'll come back to shortly. But in certain areas, um, particularly up in the Northeast, Maswell Peninsula, there is still rainforest coming all the way down to the ocean. One or two plants that are worthy of mention. Um, pitcher plants you tend to associate, this is genus Nepenthes, you tend to associate with Southeast Asia, islands like Borneo and Sumatra. But there are two species on Madagascar. It's the most westerly that the genus reaches. And this is Nepenthes madagascariensis, which is primarily restricted to rainforest region. And orchids, lots of orchids in Madagascar, um, both in dry forest and western forest. This is a particularly famous one called Angraecum sesquipedale. And the nectaries you see there are the best part of 25 to 30 centimeters in length. And when somebody showed one of these flowers to Charles Darwin, who never visited Madagascar, he immediately said, there must be a moth in Madagascar with a tongue equally long that's able to access the nectar at the bottom and act as a pollinator. And at the time, no one knew of the existence of a moth like that. And a lot of people questioned Darwin and said they doubted very much that that was going to be accurate and correct. But lo and behold, some 25 odd years later, somebody discovered the moth. Um, so this is Darwin's hawk moth, and its scientific name is Xanthopan morganae predicta, in honor of Darwin's prediction. So as you can see from that, it does indeed have a tongue that is 25 to 30 centimeters long. There are plenty of, of other weird and wacky invertebrates, um, none perhaps more so than the giraffe neck weevil, one of the island's most celebrated creatures, only found in rainforest and generally only found either on or in association with this plant, which is its primary food plant, it doesn't have a common name, it's called Dia um, and when giraffe weevils are breeding, a female rolls a portion of leaf from this plant into a cigar-like tube in which she lays a single egg. The males use these incredibly long necks that you can see to battle with one another for access to the females. Another spectacular invertebrate, a moth, obviously a comet moth, um, which we've been lucky to see, but once in a while we get lucky and a stunning creature. With, uh, this is a male um, wingspan of 20 plus centimeters, so one of the world's largest moth species. Of course, being rainforest, this is a real stronghold for frogs. 95% of all frogs in Madagascar are found nowhere else. This is one of the spotted tree frogs, Bufus repoides. Another peculiarity, a tomato frog, which is only found up in the very far northwest, sorry, northeast, around an area called Maroncetra, often associated with rice paddies and on the edge of villages. And spectacular little creature like this, this is a mantella, a Madagascar painted mantella. Superficially, if you're familiar with frogs in Central and South America, you might think it's rather like a poison dart frog, which indeed it is, it's a distant relative. And the Malagasy versions do have toxic secretions in their skin, although nothing like as potent as many of the ones um, from the poison dart frogs in Central and South America. But nonetheless, they allude to the fact that they're very unpalatable to eat. So this is a good example of warming coloration in the frog. Good for snakes, of course, in rainforest too. This is the third of the boa species. Um, different genus, this is the Malagasy tree boa, Sanzinia. The smallest of the boas in Madagascar, a large example of this would be up to a meter, meter and a half in length, and perfectly harmless. 
but able to catch not only rodents, but small lemurs as well as feed on um, lizards and so forth. Fantastic, of course, in rainforest for chameleons, um, the greatest expression of this particular family of lizards is undoubtedly within rainforest regions. This uh, is arguably one of the most beautiful, a male panther chameleon that I photographed on the beach on the Mashua Peninsula. Uh, here's a panther chameleon uh, catching its breakfast. A uh, much smaller species is only found in the central eastern side. This is a um, lance-nosed chameleon, sometimes called the Pinocchio chameleon. Um, which uh, is very small and perhaps no more than about 10 centimeters in length, but uh, obviously spectacular nonetheless. And from a very small one to a very large one, this is arguably the largest of all chameleons, Parsons chameleon, a really big male like this individual can be the best part of 60 centimeters from nose to tail tip. And primarily a canopy dweller in rainforest and not always easy to see because they're high up but uh, once in a while, you may get lucky and find one lower down. And right down to the very smallest and beautifully camouflaged, this is a stump-tailed uh, chameleon or brachysia, which lives in the leaf litter on the rainforest floor. And these can be amongst the very smallest of all chameleons. This is one of the smallest species, um, which is only found in the very far northern part of the island. Recently, there was a new discovery um, of a Bukizia, I think it's called Bukizia nanus, that is reckoned to be the smallest reptile in the world. It's about two thirds the size of this particular one. So they are absolutely minuscule and obviously very difficult to find in leaf litter on the forest floor. But if you were to give a prize in Madagascar for the best camouflage, I think you'd have to give it to this creature. This is a leaf-tailed gecko sleeping during the day flattened against a tree trunk. If you haven't worked out where it is, it's right in the center of the tree trunk with its head facing downwards, and two front legs, and then the spatula like tail reaching up to the top of the screen. Um, during the day, lies plastered against a, a tree trunk like this, resembling the bark. Here's a different species. This is the giant leaf tail gecko. A um, little easier to see this particular one. So they spend the entire day like this. Um, hoping to elude the detection. Um, and then they're active at night where they're hunting insects and other invertebrates, etc. And they divide very neatly. There are umpteen species, I think there are about 12. It's a genus called Europlatus. And there are about 12 species. And they divide very neatly into the larger ones which tend to mimic tree bark and moss, like this one. And then smaller ones which mimic shriveled dead leaves. Um, this is often called a satanic leaf tail gecko, which has the wonderful scientific name of Europlatus fantasticus, um, and is only about probably 10 to 12 centimeters long, and just spends the day curled up like this in amongst dead leaves, and obviously very difficult to find. Here's an even more specialized one that has evolved to mimic shriveled palm fronds, Europlatus lineatus, the lined leaf tail gecko. Another camouflage exponent, this time a bird. This is a collared nightjar, which is again restricted to the eastern rainforest and spends most of the day generally sleeping under a pandanus, as this one is doing. Some more spectacular endemic birds. This, I think, is Madagascar's most spectacular bird, a helmet vanger, which is only found in um, eastern rainforest, northeastern rainforest, and um, the Vanga family is um, a renowned endemic family in Madagascar. There are, I think, now 18 and 19 species, which, and they have a huge variety of beak shapes. I think had Darwin actually visited Madagascar instead of the Galapagos Islands and seen the diversity of beak shapes exhibited by Vangas, who his thoughts on evolution would have been similarly provo provoked because they're just so diverse and so different and bizarre. If you were to line all the vangas up on a single branch, you could never imagine they were all related to one another, but they are. I mentioned earlier on another endemic family, the ground rollers, uh, the slide of the long-tailed ground roller in the spiny forest. This is a pitta-like ground roller, 
again, rainforest this time. And four species occur in rainforest, pitolite ground roller, rufous headed ground roller, which tends to prefer much higher elevations, montane rainforest. And then in lowland rainforest, scaly ground roller and the short legged ground roller. And again, if you're a bird enthusiast, this is a particular family that you, most birders visiting Madagascar are always really keen to see and track down. There are endemic rodents in rainforest too, perhaps not as spectacular as the giant jumping rat, but nonetheless endearing. This is a tough-tailed rat, which if you do nocturnal walks, um, is often a species you'll see in the understory foraging for nuts and fruit, and will often freeze as this one did in a torch beam. And you can see the furry tip to its tail, hence the name. And some more tenrex. This is perhaps the most likely species you're going to see, a lowland street tenrec, um, active generally after dark, not always, sometimes during the day, but generally after dark in rainforest areas. And some more carnivores as well. This is a phanoloca, one of, again, one of the eight, as I keep mentioning, um, about the size of a domestic cat, which is primarily a rainforest species. And ringtail voncera, the commonest um, of the native carnivores in Madagascar, one that you have a reasonable chance of seeing in several rainforest locations, um, and obviously a beautiful little creature. These particular shots were taken in one of my favourite parks, a place called Marajeji, which I'll come back to shortly. And if you get really, really lucky, you might even see a fusa in rainforest. I've been fortunate over the course of my visits to Madagascar to see them several times in rainforest, but I've only really on two occasions had decent photographic opportunities. Nocturnal lemurs are also um, very much to the fore on night walks, um, another real specialty and reason for going to Madagascar is the amount of diversity you're likely to see on a night walk in a rainforest. This is a sportive or lepi lemur. Um, which, as far as primates go, has one of the lowest metabolic rates because it survives on very poor quality nutrition, very poor quality leaves. Uh, and this is a particularly interesting little species. It's called, um, um, oh gosh, uh, hairy eared dwarf lemur. Um, and when I first visited the island, uh, there were only five records of this species for the entire preceding century. Uh, and I was lucky enough to see one, um, I think around, I saw one for the first time around 2000 in a really popular park, one of the most visited parks. And certain people didn't believe me when I said that I'd seen one. I wasn't able to get a photograph, but then a couple of years later, I did get a photograph of one in the same park. Um, and lo and behold, as more research has taken place in Madagascar, there are more and more areas in the central eastern side of the island and northeastern side of the island that these particular lemurs have been seen. So they're now no longer thought to be anything like as rare as they once were. One of the interesting features about many of the lemurs is that you can't really describe them as either diurnal or nocturnal. They can be active both day and night and be particularly active at night when there's a lot of moonlight or a full moon. And as a term, um, this behavior was described or coined as cathemeral. And lemurs are amongst the very few primates that um, exhibit cathemeral behavior. So they can be equally active at any point in the 24 hour daily cycle, particularly at night if there's a full moon. And many of the brown lemur group are especially active um, at this sort of time. So this shot was taken in the rainforest of Ranama Farm. So this is a red-fronted brown lemur. Um, and this particular park, which if you remember was the very first park I visited back in 91, is very special indeed. Um, one of the reasons it became a park in 91 was on the back of the discovery of this particular lemur, which was new to science at the time in the late 80s, early 90s golden bamboo lemur, and it's still only known from Ranama Farm in a handful of other places. Um, one of the things that makes this species particularly unusual is it feeds almost exclusively on giant bamboo, 
which is laced with incredibly high concentrations of cyanide that would be more than lethal to any other primate, including human. But they've evolved a gut flora that is able to break down the cyanide toxins. So they are able to feed on giant bamboo where virtually nothing else is able to. They really cornered the market. Cornered the market, not quite, in that there is another bamboo lemur, the greater bamboo lemur, which also eats giant bamboo. But instead of eating primarily the young leaves like golden bamboo lemur, it primarily eats the pith. So these two different species have evolved to tap into a resource that's very plentiful, nothing else can eat, but they've evolved differently, so they're tapping in to different parts of the same planet. Rainforests are also fantastic places to look for another very familiar, but actually very rare lemur species. This is a black and white rough lemur. Lots of zoo collections have rough lemurs, but they're very tough to see in the wild because they've become increasingly rare. They're very susceptible to habitat disturbance. And they're also being a larger species, um, one that gets hunted quite a lot, which is something I'll come back to a little later. Um, the second rough lemur species uh, is only found on the Mashua Peninsula in the far northeast. This is the red rough lemur. If any of you have been to Jersey Zoo, Durrell Wildlife Park on Jersey, um, you will certainly see this particular species there. And perhaps my favorite group of lemurs are the Sifakas, uh, of which the rainforest Sifakas I think are the most spectacular. This is the species you would see in the rainforest of Ranama Farm. It's called Milne Edwards Sifaka. Further north in the central eastern rainforest, you would see this variant. This is Diadem Sifaka, which I, I said earlier, I think is one of the most beautiful, if not the most beautiful of all lemurs. And certainly one of the most rewarding to see is really only possible to see in this place, Marajeju that I mentioned a short while ago, um, where the pictures of the Rintel von Sierra were taken. But this is the one place that you have a realistic chance of seeing perhaps my favorite of the Sifakas, the silky Sifaka. Pure snow white, beautiful animal, incredibly rare, only found in a handful of rainforest places, Marajeju being one. Um, and I've been lucky enough to go to Marajeju numerous times and I never, never tire of tracking down and seeing this beautiful animal. The very first time I went to Marajeju was in 1998 and I spent four days there and caught one glimpse of this animal and got one appallingly bad picture. Now, thankfully, there's a group that are, have been studied um, by a lovely uh, American scientist, a chap called Eric Patel, who did the groundbreaking studies and as a consequence of his work and his students work there are groups or one particular group that are now very tolerant of being watched and can be approached quite closely so your chances of success in seeing them are much much better now than certainly when I first went to Marriage. And maybe the most spectacular of all rainforest lemurs is the injury, the most vocal by far, um, the largest up to 10 kilos in weight. Um, one that doesn't have a tail, or virtually doesn't have a tail, and is only found in rainforests in the central east and northeast, and has a lovely wailing song as well as being spectacular, um, the, um, agile in the canopy, has a call that's something appropriate or sounds very similar to a humpback whale sitting up in a tree. Um, and they're able to call so loudly that as a territorial call, you know, their call carries two, three kilometers across um, rainforest valleys. But as you can see, it's another stitched photograph, um, incredibly agile and able to leap 10, 12 kilometer gaps across canopies, etc. So that I hope has given you um, a taster at least of the amazing diversity that Madagascar has to offer. I'm just going to finish off by talking a little bit about some of the problems Madagascar faces as well, um, which cannot be overlooked. This incredibly stark graphic gives you an indication of how much forest, native forest, now remains. The green bits are the native forest that remains. The pink bits are secondary forest. The white bits are where there is no forest and the blue 
um, outlines are national parks and protected areas. So it's a pretty stark illustration of how much deforestation has taken place. When Madagascar was pristine, it may have been 85% forested. Now there's probably less than 7% of that forest remaining. So if you fly over Madagascar, the rather stark reality is this is what you will see. Huge areas of hillside completely denuded of forest and largely de denuded of anything of consequence other than very coarse grassland. This is an area in the central east where 20 years ago I was trekking around seeing and photographing lemurs and now the forest is gone. It's outside the national park but 20 years ago it was pristine forest. It no longer is. And it's just such a stark reminder of the environmental difficulties that Madagascar as an incredibly poor nation faces. One of the things that makes it so stark is that the vast majority of this deforestation is not at the hands of commercial companies and logging. It's simply at the hands of local people cutting down forests to survive, to plant their crops, to turn into charcoal, to plant their crops, primarily hill rice, cassava, manioc, um, and so forth. Um, this is hill rice being planted, but it's an incredibly destructive agricultural technique because of course, as soon as there's heavy rain, so much of the soil is washed away. And a place that has recently been cleared of forest is only fertile for two or three or four growing seasons before it becomes barren and useless, which means they have to cut down more forest. So it's a really destructive agricultural technique. And one of the problems is that Madagascar is a rice culture. These are rice paddies being um, churned and ploughed by Zebu cattle. The original colonizing people almost certainly came from Southeast Asia and brought with them a rice culture. So, so many areas in the central highlands of Madagascar now resemble Southeast Asia. It doesn't look anything like Africa. It might be close to Africa, but it bears so little resemblance to Africa. So much of the field in Madagascar is so much more closely akin to Southeast Asia. And obviously the rice culture and rice paddies are one of the reasons that's the case. Logging, of course, is an issue, particularly because some of Malagasy species like rosewood is incredibly highly valued. So while commercial logging on a grand scale is not a major problem, selective logging of very valuable trees is still an issue and goes through waves of being a big problem. You know, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, there was particular period of um, political unrest in Madagascar where a lot of um, basic infrastructure broke down and as a consequence there were two or three years where rosewood, um, illegal rosewood um, felling and collection was rife and it was a huge, huge issue. As a consequence of man being on the island and humans have only been on Madagascar for perhaps two and a half to three and a half thousand years. The impact that our species has had has been colossal, profound, um, beyond words. We know that at least 17 different lemur species have become extinct and all of the extinct species were much, much larger than any that are alive today. The largest may have been the size of a gorilla. This particular skull, which is embedded in a piece of rock um, belongs to a genus called Megalodapis and was probably about the size of an orangutan. And there have been some amazing deposits found in various places, particularly on the western side of the island, with countless skeletons of these uh, lemurs uh, where they've been discovered. Um, but there are all sorts of other amazing prehistoric species. Um, perhaps Madagascar's most famous laid this egg the largest egg ever to have been laid belonged to an elephant bird, a relative of the ostrich, a rat ant, but way, way bigger. So male adult elephant birds probably exceeded three, three and a half meters in height. 
one of the major issues that's become apparent in the relatively recent past, by which I mean the last 15 years, is how prevalent local bushmeat hunting is in Madagascar, particularly for lemurs, but also for other species. If any of you are squeamish, you may wish to look away for the next couple of slides because they're not pleasant, but um, they illustrate the point. Uh, I'll let you know when they've been taken away if you don't want to see these particular slides. So I'm about to turn, um, change the slide now. So this, believe it or not, is a cooked eye eye. Um, all lemurs are hunted, um, particularly the larger ones. Uh, in remote rural areas, they're trapped um, and they're an incredibly valuable source of protein um, and skinned and cooked and so forth. Um, obviously something that we find very difficult to deal with and stomach, um, quite literally. But if you're an incredibly poor Malagasy and this is the only protein you're likely to get, of course you're going to harvest it. So it's one of the difficulties that all of the conservation efforts in Madagascar face is trying to balance how they deal with providing protein with um, uh, to local communities that are protein deficient um, in order to reduce the likelihood that they're going to um, directly hunt lemurs. So if you're squeamish you can come back now um, and tourism is there to play a part. Um, most of the protected areas that now exist in Madagascar um, have been set up um, to welcome tourists. As I mentioned back when I first visited, there were only three national parks. There are now over 20. Um, and most of them are able to be visited. Some of them you need to be able to camp, but there are large numbers now where there are lodges of varying qualities and the tourist experience when it is done well is fantastic and you get a chance to interact with local people on their terms um, and I stress their terms because I loathe tourism that impacts on local communities and is imposed on them but most of the places where it happens in Madagascar it's done in a way that's sympathetic and at least in theory 50 percent of all money from national park fees should be diverted back to local communities. I say in theory, because of course, corruption is rife and that doesn't always happen, but at least in theory, that's what should be happening. And obviously the trickle down effect of foreign money coming into these areas helps boost economies. And the tourism in, uh, experience in Madagascar can be absolutely sublime. In the national parks that receive good numbers of tourists, lemurs have become completely habituated, so you get wonderful experiences with purely wild animals, but you're up close and personal. But again, on their terms, you know, they can move around as they choose. These particular diadem chipakas were down feeding on soil and were very happy for people just to be sat close by and they carried on utterly regardless. Similarly, uh, in one particular forest in the central east, there's a group of Indri that are very tolerant and, and have become very used to being viewed at close quarters. Um, so this sort of experience is pure magic and it cannot underestimate how important it can be um, to generate that feeling of tourism doing some good in an area. I'm not saying it does good all the time, but there's, there are problems. And of course, when there are field camps, animals come and scavenge and so forth. So you get bizarre circumstances where animals that you're desperate to see and are difficult to see at times, like a fusa, actually come and raid a camp or even worse, raid a rubbish tip. So this is the last sort of thing you want to see. And it does illustrate some of the problems that tourism can create. But by and large, I would advocate that there is far more benefit comes from the tourism than um, detrimental elements. A detrimental element that has recently become apparent, and I've actually only been finding out about this over the course of the last few months, as I've been researching, doing an update of one of my books, is the influence on photographs that photographs like this are having. Um, 
this is taken as a particular place that if any of you have visited Madagascar, you may well have been to uh, a place at Bacona Lodge called Lima Island. And I've been many times with groups that I've taken. I won't go again. The simple reason being that photographs like this being posted on social media in Madagascar are now effectively promoting wild lemurs being trapped to be kept as pets because it has been a real upsurge in the last five years of lemurs being trapped to be kept as pets because of people posting pictures like this, which obviously promotes the idea of, of petting lemurs. So this was a place where lemurs that had been kept illegally were given a better home. They were on an island where they were free ranging and they obviously had to be fed. And everyone thought, well, that was a good thing. And then suddenly something becomes apparent, which is hugely negative and you realize it's not a good thing. So subsequently on my future trips to Madagascar, I will no longer be going to Lima Island and no longer be doing this. And I would certainly encourage any of you who are planning to go to Madagascar to try and avoid this sort of scenario, however tempting it may be. So I've been traveling around Madagascar pretty much every year since 1991. I've missed about four years, I think, in that period. This is me a couple of years ago in Marajaji, my favorite place. And obviously I've seen lots and lots of changes. Um, a lot of deforestation, so changes to the worst areas that were, there once was forest and now there no longer is, but also a lot of change for good where communities that have not had anything prior to tourism are able to benefit from the money and influx that tourism brings. So it's all about striking a balance. And I'm not for one moment suggesting that the balance that is currently struck is as good as it needs to be. There are lots of improvements need to be made, but I still would advocate that overall, if forests in Madagascar have any chance of survival, then tourism will be playing a very central role in that, um, hopefully that capacity for forests to remain in Madagascar. Obviously my love affair with Madagascar goes back a long time. And if I may blatantly um, plug um, something I've been working on, having not traveled now for a year, for the last nine months, I've been working on a new edition of my Mammals of Madagascar book, which will be out um, hopefully June, 2022. This is me face to face with a Fusa in Karindi. Um, so that's a little plug for something that's in the pipeline, but still being worked on. Um, I'm gonna finish there and hand back to Chris. I know we've got a little Q and A session. So um, Chris, if you're there, um, over to you. Um, goodness, Nick, I don't really know what to say. I really did not want that to finish. It was absolutely stunning. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was absolutely brilliant. Uh, I will, I'm gonna stick my neck out here um, and say that it was without doubt the best talk we've had in our series so far. Uh, absolute cool. Chris. Absolute corker. Um, I shall read you before I before I uh, before I ask you one or two questions. I am going to read you a couple of comments that have come up in chat, but they're just the ones that I can see in front of me here, without scrolling. Um, uh, uh, magnificent pictures uh, is one. Thank you, Nick, for an amazing talk. Wonderful, loved it all. Blah blah blah. You won't be able to get down the stairs, Nick. <laughs> um, hey. Uh, a number of people. I'm gonna. I'm. I'm. I'm also going to just uh, say that your next trip that you're due to lead um, is in September 2023, on which we have a big wait list. I'm putting this in now because I know that fairly soon people will start dropping off this presentation as we approach nine o'clock. We know that happens. That's fine. That's no problem. Um, I'm throwing it out now because. Um, We've launched one of our departures for 2023 already, um, which is in September 2023, because it uh, because we have had a, a long wait list for a long time. We're hoping to get a second um, September 2023 departure running. 
Um, it's October. not on our website yet. <laughs> um, it's not on our website yet. Um, so for those of you that remain on the call that would like to travel to Madagascar with Nick, I mean, A, who else uh, better could there possibly be to travel to Madagascar with? Um, but B, if you are interested, um, then please do make contact with us and we can we can put you on the wait list. Um, Nick, with that in mind, um, a couple of... Mm. Uh, uh, well, many, many questions, but a couple of people have asked particularly um, about transportation. I thought it might be quite an interesting thing just for you to describe, um, firstly, how you get to Madagascar, because I think that's quite an important factor, yeah. um, and transportation around in Madagascar, um, and what the accommodation is like. And of course, I know, uh, because you've helped us design a number of our Madagas Madagascar trips uh, uh, over the years, Nick, and um, we've chatted about them together, but uh, this doesn't just refer, of course, to the trips that you lead, but perhaps to our Madagascar trips generally. Sure. OK, um, well, first question, how to get to Madagascar. Um, the three primary routes would be via Paris with Air France. So it's a direct flight from Paris to Antananarivo. Um, you could go with Air Kenya via Nairobi uh, or via South Africa, via Joburg. Uh, the fourth option would be to go via Mauritius. Um, the first two are probably, I would say, the two best ones to look at, yeah. um, but it obviously depends on other aspects of any particular itinerary or if you have particular airline preferences as well. But there's no there's no direct flight from the UK, so you've always got to go via somewhere else. Yeah. Um, getting around Madagascar is not straightforward. Uh, the road system is generally poor. There are only a handful of very good roads. Um, so most itineraries would require a combination of domestic flights and then road journeys. And those are simply to get to whichever ever national park or forest you're visiting. Once you're in the wildlife location, it's all on foot. Um, so all your wildlife watching and photography is on foot and you're simply using the air network and road network to get from A to B. Um, it's time consuming. So one of the things that I would always recommend to people is make sure whatever itinerary you choose, give yourself plenty of time. Mm, yeah, Most people would not go to Madagascar for anything less than two weeks. And I would certainly say two and a half weeks is better, even three. But even within that, a two week slot, I would be reluctant to suggest going to more than four locations. So you've got to pick and choose your locations carefully, yeah. depending on what you want to see. Um, because as I hope was clear from what I've just described, certain areas you are you need to go to certain areas to see certain things and you can pick an itinerary that's a combination of different forest types where you'll see different combinations of lemurs chameleons birds etc yeah but different parks will offer different combinations so you can't see it all in one go utterly impossible so certainly on a two-week trip i would say no more than four locations on a two and a half week trip maybe five locations but if you start trying to go to more you'll be spreading yourself too thinly. You'll spend more time traveling, less time in the location, actually watching and enjoying wildlife. Quality of accommodation is variable. The better or more visited parks, places like Ranamathan, Andasi Bay, Isalu, um, and Karana, um, et cetera, they all have decent quality lodges, not the sort of quality that we've come to expect in Africa or better quality India, but they're adequate. Um, there are one or two that are really, really nice now, but they're, they're few and far between. Most of the accommodation is definitely a little lower in standard than other wildlife destinations that you're perhaps familiar with. Once you start going to more remote places, like say Dharana that I talked quite a bit about, it's very basic camps. Um, there's now a an actual camp there with very basic shallows, but it's nonetheless pretty basic um, and it's hot. So you get hot and sticky and sweaty and you might just have a bucket of cold water to splash yourself with or a rudimentary shower. Um, 
So obviously, again, if that's a consideration and you don't want to go down a route of having to stay somewhere that's a little more rustic, that would influence where you would choose to go. Thank you, Nick. That's absolutely brilliant. And I, and I, and I think a connected question then um, would, would have to um, be... Sorry, Chris, um, your, your connection dropped you. You can just repeat that. Yes, absolutely. So I was going to say a, a, a connected question would have to be um, when is the best time to go? And I fully appreciate that the answer to that will very much vary um, depending on what you want to see. And of course, the yes. part of the country you want to go to. But there's perhaps a, a, a broad. There's a broad window. So I think if you were to look at the offerings of just about any worthwhile tour operator, um, Madagascar trips would fall in the window between September and the end of November. Yep. Um, all things considered, that's where you're going to see maximum diversity. The weather conditions at their best, it's the driest time of the year. Um, so on the rainforest side, you're less likely to get very wet. Uh, September, October, lemurs have their young, so you've obviously got that additional factor. And it's the equivalent of early spring, so birds are starting to breed and become more active. Where you lose out at that time of year because it's dry is that you'd see fewer amphibians and see fewer reptiles. If you go later in the year, so November into December, when you may have had the first rains, you'd see a greater variety of amphibians and reptiles. Um, you would not go to Madagascar January, February, March, because that's cyclone season and it's yeah. very wet and getting around would be incredibly difficult and you'd struggle like crazy. Um, so from probably mid-April onwards, you could start going back to Madagascar. Um, if you went in late April and May, you'd see Lima's courtship display um, and you'd still see plenty of amphibians and reptiles, but the bird life would be less obvious because it's kind of coming into winter. So, and some of the chameleons, some of the nocturnal lemurs like dwarf lemurs would have started hibernating. So you wouldn't see those. So there isn't a single time you're going to see everything at its best, but hopefully that gives you a sort of idea. Yeah, that's super. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Nick. That's that's great. Actually, I, I'm I am going to ask you a more specific question on that on, on, on time of year as well, actually, because um, somebody and forgive me, I, I didn't make a note of the name, but someone on chat um, has asked me when the best time of year for the orchids is. That question, of course, came in particularly when you were um, yeah. talking about the orchids, um, particularly for Darwin's orchid. Short answer to that is for Darwin's orchid, I'm not sure. Um, orchids in general, when it starts to get a little wetter, so mid-November onwards. Yeah. Um, so that's a bit of a balancing act. Yeah. Um, it but, often is, isn't it? Yes. It, 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 it? You know, you've got you've got a, a window of opportunity and you, you perhaps increase your chances by going in this relatively yeah. short period. But but you might get wet as well. <laughs> and head, but, but yeah, you might get wet and but you're hedging your bets in the right yeah. direction. No. Um, so so there have been a number of questions as well, Nick, um, about um, about photography. Mm. Um, a number of people have been asking about um, the best cameras to take is there anything specific that they need to take uh that they need to take or they particularly need to think about um in respect of um a trip to madagascar okay. i know i i'm just going to make make reference i know um trevor trevor platt emailed me earlier in the day today or possibly yesterday um trevor you uh will get a full answer to to to, to your email but i'm I, posing at least this question broadly, um, but we'll email you tomorrow with a more complete answer for you. But I, I, but a number of people have asked photographic related questions. Okay. Um, the good news is you don't need to travel with a really long lens um, because in so many places, the lemurs um, are tolerant and habituated. So a lot of the time your subjects are relatively close. So to cover lots of bases of something like a 100 to 400 if you're a Canon user or if you like me, a Nikon user, uh, an 80 to 400 
would work very well on a full frame camera. You wouldn't necessarily need a crop sensor camera. Um, I would always travel with a macro lens because of the frogs, the insects, the small stuff. So a 105 macro. And I'd also travel with a wide angle for more scenic stuff, habitat stuff. So a 24 to 120, or if you wanted a real wide angle of 16 to 35 or something like that. Uh, I would also, particularly if you're keen on photography, travel with a flash gun and a diffuser box, but that's getting more specific and specialized. Um, but that just increases your opportunity, particularly with smaller stuff. Obviously, most of this is forest photography, so light can be an issue, particularly in the rainforest. So cameras that perform well with high ISOs are obviously beneficial. Now, most modern cameras mm. are incredibly good, even up to ISO 3200, which is plenty enough. I'm often shooting at above 2000, 3200, 4000 in rainforest now, and because the cameras I'm using are so good, it's difficult to tell. Um, but if you're using an older digital camera, that may not be the case. And you know, there's one of the advantages, as advantages of having more up-to-date kit. Um, and in conjunction, I would always take a tripod simply because the ability to hold cameras and lenses rock steady in dark conditions is so crucial. It's not always dark, of course, particularly in the southern spiny forest, the western deciduous forest, it can be much more open with a lot of light, but it can get gloomy. So I would always travel with a tripod, but that goes for any trip that I do, quite frankly. Um, so I hope that's it's a slightly fudged answer, but at least gives some sort of idea. But there's no, certainly no need to think you need to travel with big, long, heavy te telephotos, 500, 600. In Madagascar, not no really need. Required. Um, and 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 Nick, in 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 relation to um, cameras and and the travel generally, um, um, what about um, in, internal flights and so on? Are there, you know, do, I mean, that's a consideration, of course. I mean, course. We, 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 we've had this this conversation in relation to one or two other places around mm. the world, one or two other talks, of course. As more and more people move to mirrorless cameras, which are generally lighter, yeah, and the new lenses and so on and so forth. I mean, that's a stretch for uh, the vast majority of people. I completely get that, but it will become less of an issue, I think. But, but yeah, um, but what about weight restrictions? Well, it's certainly a factor. Um, Air Madagascar can be rather painful, um, <laughs> particularly uh, on flights leaving Tanny. When you're on flights in regional airports, the security and their um, insistence on weight restrictions is less of an issue, but it certainly can be an issue when you're flying out of Tanny. Um, now, I Frankly, I always travel with a lot more kit than the weight restriction, and I always manage to find a way to fudge it. But I appreciate that some people don't feel comfortable about that. Um, so it is certainly something that you have to bear in mind if you want to play by the rules. Um, I generally bend the rules a little bit, um, so manage surely to not. Surely, <laughs> so. <laughs> managed to find a way to get on and off planes with hand luggage that is um, over and above the uh, official allowance often. But it's certainly a factor that is worth bearing in mind. Um, it's obviously a thorny subject and there isn't an absolute right or wrong answer. No, um, fair enough. We can be more specific if people ask us more specific yeah. questions when, about a particular departure they're planning on. When when I've done my trips, my photographic trips, obviously the vast majority of people that come on them, or a good number of people that come on them, are keen photographers, so they have a lot of kit. And we've always managed to find a way to make it work. I'll leave it at that. 
yeah, fair enough. Um, so Nick, as you can imagine, and for everybody that is um, is still with us, of which there are many, I have to say, um, uh, I think as it's as it's ten past nine, we won't go on much longer. But um, for those of you that uh, have asked questions that we we haven't got to, then um, please accept our apologies. Um, if we can. You, we keep a record of the chat, so if we can come back to you with the answers to your questions, we'll do our very best. There's all sorts of questions about um, wanting to combine wildlife and scuba diving, and is it possible to see all five Shafaka species um, on one trip, and blah, blah, all sorts of different things. But I'm going to end, end Nick. If nine Shafaka species, I need to correct someone there, there are nine. Nine, sorry, actually I, I, I misread what has been said. It said, is it possible to see all Shafaka species in, of, on a five week trip? I, I uh, that's so. five week trip it probably would be actually yeah. so uh, but anyway there's oodles of questions um but I guess that one one question which um which perhaps is is where we should where we should leave it is in in many places around the world you know lovely wilderness locations that we visit um you and I and 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 all of the people that are, are on board um this evening um it does feel to me that uh, that tourism can can actually be uh, well-placed tourism and environmental tourism can actually be a real savior for wildlife you and i have had this conversation mm. about places like botswana and zimbabwe zambia various parts of south america and so on borneo and others but do, do you in spite of the um you know the deforestation and the uh, and the and the environmental issues that there are um, mm. in Madagascar. Do you think that that could be the case in Madagascar? Do you think it is the case in Madagascar? Well, I think if there's any chance that things are going to survive, it has to be the case. I think tourism, it's not a panacea. It's not uh, a get out of jail card that's going to solve everything, but when it's done well, it can be an integral part of an overall plan that gives a particular area the best chance of survival. I think there's an, there's an inevitability that most of the places in Madagascar will become isolated islands of forest. Some of them virtually already are. Mm. Um, but the amazing thing is when you go into those forests, you realize how bristling with wildlife they still are. Mm. Uh, and if that's got any chance of persisting, tourism has to be an integral part of it in some way. It won't provide all the answers and it will provide some problems, but it has a chance of providing more answers and contributing to a holistic um, success story than if there wasn't tourism. I mean, uh, that leads on to a, and this is obviously a huge topic, but it leads on to that notion of should we be flying as much and of mm. course that question is crucial to wildlife tourism any tourism around mm. the world and my answer to that would always be you need to look at the whole equation so while flying in itself is not necessarily a good thing if nobody flew and there were no tourists going to madagascar or the serengeti or the pantanal or wherever it would be those places would see, almost cease to have a justification yeah. to yeah. still survive as wildlife places. Yeah. And then we'd be in an even worse predicament. Yeah. So it's about striking a balance that comes from considering all factors and finding the best fit. We're far from there now, but that's what we've got to work towards. Nick, thank you so much. Um, that was absolutely superb. Um, Thank you. Uh, really wonderful you, evening and a wonderful presentation. I know that um, I speak on your behalf, Nick, as well when uh, when I say thank you to everybody um, who has been with us all evening. Indeed, we really appreciate you. you spending your time with us. We really do. We have such lovely comments, such fantastic feedback that we get from everybody. Um, it's really wonderful. So thank you. Nick, may I ask you just to put that final slide on for me? Would that be okay? I will indeed. Sorry, should have done um, that. No, no, no. That's that's fine. Um, 
so it will be lovely to see you all again next week. Um, the next talk is on Tuesday, which is give, being given by the wonderful Helen Bryan um, about India. I know lots of you really enjoy Helen's talks too. Um, please keep an eye out. Uh, you may have seen this on an email that came out today. Um, that we have a new series of talks, um, or sorry, I should say, well, perhaps in two parts. We have released um, a number of, uh, of our talks and presentations um, for April. So we have a, a lovely new set of talks and presentations which are now available. They're all up on our website for you to, to sign up to. I suspect many of you already have. But we also have a, a, um, a series of trip specific talks, um, which we are doing at lunch times. Uh, just much shorter talks about some of our most popular trips. Please do sign up for those. They'll be in a little bit more depth. We'll be talking more about um, the vehicles, the accommodation, um, and of course the wildlife in, in the locations. Um, look, that's it for us, uh, from us for this evening. Um, Nick, thank you once again. It's been great. It's always great chatting. Thank you, everyone. It's always great hearing your presentations. Thank you, everybody, for, for being on board. We'll see you again next week, hopefully.